Hi, the most important things to know before venturing into treating brachial plexus injuries are the basic concepts like knowledge of anatomy, precise clinical examination, ordering relevant investigations and interpreting them, and planning the appropriate strategy. These are all summed up in a nutshell for you. The plexus is formed by the anterior primary rami of the cervical spinal nerve C5, C6, C7 and C8 and the first thoracic spinal nerve T1. This is the ventral root of the spinal nerve. This is the dorsal root with the dorsal root ganglion. They join together to form the spinal nerve which exits through the intervertebral foramen. It gives rise to the posterior ramus and the anterior ramus. Two main branches and then two small branches, the grey ramus and the white ramus. The anterior rami of the root contributes to the brachial plexus formation. It consists of five parts. The roots, trunks, divisions, cords and the branches. The roots C5, 6, 7, 8 and T1. The C5 and C6 roots join together to form the upper trunk, the C7 continues as the middle trunk and the C8 and T1 join to form the lower trunk. Each trunk gives off an anterior and posterior division. The anterior divisions of the upper and middle trunks join to form the lateral cord. The posterior divisions of the upper, middle and lower trunks join together to form the posterior cord and the anterior division of the lower trunk continues as the medial cord. From the roots we have two branches, from the trunks two branches and from the cords seven branches and six terminal branches. The branches from the roots are the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerve which supplies the serratus anterior muscle. From the trunks, only the upper trunk has branches, the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius. Regarding the branches from the cords, from the lateral cord we have one nerve branch and two terminal branches, the lateral pectoral nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve and lateral root of the median nerve which are the terminal branches. Remember the mnemonic LML. The lateral pectoral nerve receiving fibers from C5, 6, 7. The musculocutaneous nerve receiving both motor and sensory fibers from C5, 6 and 7 and the lateral root of the median nerve which is mainly sensory given away from the lateral cord. From the posterior cord we have the branches from the nerve that is the upper subscapular, lower subscapular and thoracodorsal nerve and the terminal branches the axillary nerve and the radial nerve remembered by the mnemonic ULTAR. As we have seen the upper subscapular nerve, lower subscapular nerve, the thoracodorsal nerve supplying the latissimus dorsi muscle, the axillary nerve supplying the deltoid and teres minor and the sensation on the lateral aspect of upper arm and the radial nerve which receives both motor and sensory fibers from C5, 6, 7, 8 and T1 roots. From the medial cord we have three nerve branches, the three M's, medial pectoral nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and two terminal branches, the medial root of median nerve and the ulnar nerve. The medial pectoral nerve which innervates the sternal fibers of the pectoralis major, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the terminal branches, the medial root or the median nerve which is mainly motor to the muscles of the hand and the ulnar nerve which gets fibers from C8 and T1 only. We need to remember that the roots arise between the scalenus anterior anteriorly and the scalenus medius posteriorly. The trunks are seen at the level of the posterior triangle. The divisions are seen behind the level of the clavicle and the cords even more distally under the level of the pectoralis minor muscle. When a patient presents to you with a brachial plexus injury, it may be obvious that he has the injury. But what may not be obvious is the severity and extent of the lesion. The aim of such an evaluation would be to localize the lesion, whether it is preganglionic or postganglionic, and to determine the severity, that is, whether it is a neuropraxia or a neurotmesis. We also need to evaluate the level of the injury, the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, or the terminal nerves. For, ex <clears throat> for examination of the neck, look for any bruising, look for scars, look for the neck being tilted to the opposite side, look for fullness in the supraclavicular area, look for break in continuity of the clavicle, look for a drooping shoulder and look for loss of contour of the shoulder. Gentle tapping in the supraclavicular area may elicit either pain in the local area, no pain or pain radiating to the upper limb or a tinnel sign. Before we learn about testing the muscles, we need to know about the muscle power. No muscle contraction is M0. Palpable muscle contraction detectable by the examiner is M1. Active joint movement present with gravity eliminated is M2. Full joint movement possible against gravity is M3. 
full range of movement against some resistance is M4 and full range of motion with maximal force is M5 of 13 steps starting with sensory examination. To remember easily that is the C5 area that is the lateral aspect of the arm, the medial lateral aspect of the forearm which is the C6 territory extending up to the tip of the thumb, the C7 territory extending up to the ring finger, the ring and little fingers up to the palm on the ulnar border C8 territory and the medial aspect of the forearm which is the T1 territory. The next step of examining the phrenic nerve is mainly based on radiological investigations and the next step is for the dorsal scapular nerve. The classically described test for the rhomboids involves placing the patient's palm facing outwards on his lower back and asking the patient to push backwards against resistance. The next step involves testing the serratus anterior innervated by the long thoracic nerve. The test can be performed in sitting position with both arms outstretched on a table in front. The examiner uses his thumb and fingers to track the movement of the scapula and feel the serratus and the patient is asked to project his entire extremity forward while the examiner feels for the movement of the scapula away from the midline. Examining the suprascapular nerve involves testing two muscles, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. If the patient is not able to abduct the shoulder in the test as shown, gravity should be eliminated and the supraspinatus should now be checked. The infraspinatus is tested with the patient in supine position and he is asked to externally rotate the shoulder. The examination of the axillary nerve involves testing the deltoid and the teres minor. The anterior fibers are tested by asking the patient to abduct the shoulder from a forward position of the shoulder. The middle portion of the deltoid is examined in the similar manner except that there is no forward flexion and only abduction is done. The posterior portion of the deltoid is examined in the same position as the middle portion but instead of abduction, the patient is asked to slide his arm backwards. The next step is testing the thoracodorsal nerve via the action of the latissimus dorsi. For testing the latissimus dorsi muscle, the patient can be asked to forcefully adduct his arm against resistance and the latissimus dorsi muscle can be palpated. A better test would be to test the cough reflex by placing the hands, examiner's hands on both sides of the flank and asking the patient to cough. The reflex can be felt when the latissimus dorsi is active. Now two branches from the posterior cord that is the upper and lower subscapular nerves are tested. The upper subscapular nerve supplies the subscapularis and the lower one supplies the teres major. The subscapularis is examined with the patient in sitting position, shoulder abducted to 90 degrees and supported by the examiner's hand. The patient is now asked to move the arm backwards and upwards. If he is able to move it, it indicates M3 grade. It is a little more difficult to test the teres major in isolation and its function is best felt by palpating the muscle lateral to the lower border of the scapula when testing the subscapularis and latissimus dorsi. The medial and lateral pectoral nerves together supply the pectoralis major muscle. But we must remember that the lateral pectoral nerve supplies the clavicular head and the medial pectoral nerve supplies the sternal head. To test the clavicular fibers, the patient is in a sitting position with the shoulder abducted 90 degree, elbow partially flexed and the palm facing downward. While the examiner keeps palpating the upper fibers of the pectoralis major, the patient is asked to move his entire upper limb forward. To test the sternal fibers of the pectoralis major, the patient is asked to move his unsupported arm towards his opposite hip and the sternal fibers are seen or palpated. The motor supply by the musculocutaneous nerve is mainly tested by testing the biceps and the brachialis function function, there are two main functions, one is elbow flexion, the second is forearm supination. The elbow flexion is tested and the power of the biceps is noted. The second point is the supination where the patient is asked to supinate the forearm with the elbow kept in 90 degree flexion. Testing the brachialis is also simple, elbow flexion is tested with the forearm kept in total pronated position and the patient is asked to flex the elbow. The radial nerve is next evaluated by examining the following muscles, the supinator, the triceps, brachioradialis, extensors of the wrist, fingers and the thumb. When testing the supinator, we must remember that the biceps must be kept elongated, that is the elbow must be kept extended. 
the patient is asked to forcefully supinate the forearm against resistance. When testing the triceps, it is important to test the elbow extension against gravity because gravity is going to aid in the extension of the elbow. In testing the brachioradialis, an important point again, elbow flexion must be tested with the forearm in mid prone position. Now it is being demonstrated on a normal side and the patient is asked to perform the flexion. You can palpate and even see the brachioradialis muscle getting prominent. The radial nerve involvement in the hand along with the median nerve and the ulnar nerve can be tested as follows. We check the complete fist, wrist extension, finger extension and wrist flexion. In testing the hand muscles, first we palpate the thenar muscles, the tone of the thenar and hypothenar muscles and then check for the opposition. Opposition must be opposition of or pulp to pulp pinch between the thumb and the fingers. Next is checking the lumbrical position, the integrity of the intrache and the lumbricals. Then the abductor, abductors, that is the dorsal intrache supplied by the ulnar nerve. The flexor digitorum profundus of all the fingers are individually tested and the tone of the joint is also tested after making the flexor digitorum profundus contract. Once it is done, the FDS of the index finger is then che checked by asking the patient to oppose the index and the thumb and if the patient is able to make a good O. Next is checking the FD flexor distance superficialis of the middle finger, the ring finger and the little finger. Along with this, the tone of the DIP joint must be checked to make sure that it is not the FDP that is performing the action. There are two simple tests to demonstrate the intactness of the ulnar nerve and the median nerve. The first is asking the patient to cross his index and mid fingers which indicates an intact ulnar nerve. And a good opposition with a good tone in the thenar muscles indicates that the median nerve is intact. So clinical findings that suggest preganglionic lesion are the position of the neck, the presence of Horner syndrome, the presence of emptiness in the supraclavicular area and burning pain in the anesthetic limb, dry skin over the area of anesthesia which can be tested by moving a plastic pen over the area, paralysis of serratus anterior rhomboids and absence of tinnels or neuroma pain. Nothing can replace a thorough clinical examination of a patient who has presented with a brachial plexus injury. We need to remember that all investigations are only adjuncts in the complete assessment of the brachial plexus injury. The main investigations come under the categories of histamine test, radiological investigations and electrodiagnostic tests. X-rays may show fracture of the first rib, fractures of the cervical spine, transverse process, chest X-ray may show elevation of the hemidiaphragm showing phrenic nerve palsy, fractures of the clavicle may be seen, fractures of the other ribs can also be seen. The next investigation usually ordered is the myelogram to demonstrate the traumatic pseudo meningocele. CT myelography has definite advantages over the conventional myelography. This is how it appears on the myelogram showing the ventral roots and the dorsal roots. The next investigation done is usually an MRI of the brachial plexus. It has certain advantages like a higher soft tissue contrast, it can differentiate intravascular flow and multiplanar capabilities. So what all can we see in an MRI? We can see the root avulsions, we can see lateral displacement of the cords, we can see pseudo meningocele's, spinal cord edema and even denervation atrophy. The need for electrodiagnostic studies is manifold. First is the pre-operative assessment. Electrodiagnostic studies help to confirm the diagnosis pinpoint the lesions and determine the severity of the axial discontinuity. Intraoperative electrophysiological studies can suggest nerves as potential donors for surgical procedures and can also study the involved segment of the nerve where it is doubtful. Even after brachial plexus surgery or just following up a patient with a brachial plexus injury, electrophysiological studies will help to study the re of the upper limb. The main types of electrical studies that we are going to see are nerve conduction studies, needle electromyography and 
somatosensory or motor evoked potentials. Nerve conduction studies are mainly divided into motor conduction and sensory conduction studies. When the needle is inserted into the muscle, there are three phases of activity that can be seen. The first phase consists of the insertional activity. The second phase occurs with the needle inside the muscle and the muscle is at rest. The third phase of EMG activity occurs when the contraction of the muscle begins and the force starts increasing. In a denervated muscle, we do not see any of the features that we noted in a normal muscle. We see the fibrillation potentials, the positive sharp waves and the prolonged F wave. We have seen the changes in a denervated muscle. When the muscle starts getting re innervated there are certain signs which can be detected by the EMG. First is the occurrence of nascent potentials, the presence of unstable polyphasic potentials, decreased number of fibrillation potentials and increasing number of motor unit potentials. Planning in upper plexus lesions. The very same C56 or C567 lesions can present in different situations. We need to make a plan for each situation. Before we go into the specifics of the planning for upper brachial plexus lesions, we shall now see the basic principles of reconstruction of the brachial plexus injury. Neurolysis, primary neurography, nerve reconstruction with grafts, nerve transfers and secondary procedures are the modalities of management. The specifics regarding the upper brachial plexus lesion management. In C56 lesions, there are only two goals. One is the restoration of elbow flexion and this is the first goal. The second goal is the restoration of shoulder abduction and external rotation. For C567 lesions, the priorities are the same except that we have added elbow extension as one of our aims. When on exploration, we find scarred nerves but we find that there is an electrical conduction across the nerves by recording nerve action potentials, neurolysis will get good results. In postganglionic lesions, when the proximal root stumps are available, nerve grafting can be done. These are the common nerves that can be used as non-vascularized nerve grafts. The sural nerve, the lateral antibrachial nerve or the lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm and the forearm, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the forearm. Vascularized nerve grafts in the form of the ulnar nerve based on the superior ulnar collateral artery is the usually preferred nerve graft. In preganglionic lesions, we will not get the proximal nerve stump, so we need to plan for nerve transfers. The next point to remember before doing the nerve transfer is that we need to achieve both shoulder abduction and external rotation. We shall see the different nerves that are available for transfer in preganglionic C56 lesions. The first is the spinal accessory nerve with about 1300 to 1600 fibers. The phrenic nerve is also an important nerve for transfer. However, the diaphragmatic and pulmonary function must be assessed before this procedure is done. And the impairment, the intercostal nerve, which supplies about 3000 fibers each, is also a mixed nerve. In C56 lesions, we have noted that the function of the hand is completely present. Here, we can use a fascicle from the ulnar nerve to neurotize the motor branch to the biceps. To strengthen the power of the elbow flexion that can be achieved, the neurotization of the brachialis muscle also can be done using a fascicle from the median nerve. Before we make a plan for the reconstruction, we need to know what are the goals that we need to achieve. In other words, what is it that we want to achieve in that particular patient? The first important thing is elbow flexion, then it is shoulder stability, elbow extension, then finger flexion and finger extension. In the first type, it starts with shoulder, then elbow, then finger, whereas the distal to proximal starts with finger and elbow and finally the shoulder. In the proximal to distal reconstruction, the nerve reconstruction is the mainstay of management of the shoulder, elbow and finger, whereas in the distal to proximal reconstruction, the nerve reconstruction is reserved only for the shoulder maybe, but the other that is the elbow and fingers are reconstructed with other procedures like instance free functional muscle transfers. All the nerve reconstructions can be done in a single stage, but 
the distal to proximal reconstruction requires multiple stages. So it is obvious that the proximal to distal reconstruction is preferred in patients who are presented very early. The rehabilitation period of the proximal to distal reconstruction is much longer, that is about 4 years, whereas the distal to proximal reconstruction is usually complete by about 2 years. So, we can select highly intelligent or motivated patients for the proximal to distal reconstruction. But if it is going to take 4 years, what is the need for doing a proximal to distal reconstruction? Even though it takes time, the proximal to distal reconstruction is supposed to yield better results as far as the shoulder, the elbow flexion, finger flexion are concerned, though finger extension is not very good. In distal to proximal reconstruction, the results of elbow flexion, finger flexion and finger extension are average, but the shoulder is usually fused. Before we plan the strategies, we shall see what are all the available donors for nerve reconstruction. First is the roots, which happens in case of rupture, the proximal roots are available. The next is the phrenic nerve. Third is the spinal accessory nerve. Then we have the intercostal nerves from 2 to 7. We always have the contralateral C7 root, which can be used as a transfer using a vascularized ulnar nerve graft. A scenario where all the roots are avulsed. Now, experts in the field have already devised protocols for such situations. We do not have to stick exactly to these protocols, but we need to use this as a base, which can be modified to suit our patients. According to Tate's protocol, there are four stages of reconstruction for a pan palsy. In stage 1, the plexus is explored and whatever roots are available are used for neurotization. The spinal accessory is transferred to the suprascapular nerve and the contralateral C7 is used either to the lateral cord to achieve biceps and pectoralis major or the posterior cord to achieve deltoid triceps and extensor carpi radialis longus function. So by the first stage, shoulder stability, elbow flexion or elbow extension are achieved. In the second stage, which is 3 months following the first stage, free functional gracilis transfer is done using the thoracodorsal vessels and the intercostal nerves to achieve finger and thumb flexion. One intercostal nerve is used for the triceps if C7 had been given to the lateral cord. So by the second stage, finger and thumb flexion and elbow extension are achieved. In the third stage, which is one year after the second stage, wrist fusion is done and in stage 4, Tendon transfers to improve hand function for grasping and shoulder fusion if the shoulder is unstable. Summarizing the procedures for elbow flexion, the phrenic nerve can be transferred, the intercostal nerves can be transferred or contralateral C7 also can be transferred when it is neurotized to both the median and the musculocutaneous nerves. Summarizing the procedures for shoulder function, anterior transfer of the spinal accessory to the suprascapular nerve or the posterior transfer or the transfer of intercostal nerves to the axillary nerve can also be done. For elbow extension, either intercostal nerves for direct transfer to the nerve of the long head of the triceps or the contralateral C7 can be used when it can be transferred simultaneously to the median nerve and the triceps branch. But since this nerve transfer does not neurotize synergistic muscles, it may not be very effective. As far as elbow, wrist and finger extension are concerned, the intercostal nerve seems to be the relatively optimal donor for the triceps and using the same to reconstruct these three functions is quite reasonable and effective. As regards achieving finger flexion, contralateral C7 nerve transfer is the most commonly used method for restoring function in the median nerve. Among the C8-T1 lesions, Ruptures are very rare, they are usually avulsed and when avulsed they are usually rarely alone, they are usually associated with the rupture of the C5, 6 or 7 roots. As you may know, Horner syndrome consists of four features, meiosis, ptosis, apparent enophthalmos and anhydrosis on the same side of the face. Proximal repair of postganglionic injuries of the lower plexus usually is not done because it yields poor functional results. Distal nerve transfers and tendon transfers are usually preferred. The priorities of reconstruction for lower plexus injuries are restoration of finger and thumb flexion, pronators of the forearm, elbow and wrist extensors if they are involved, reanimation of intrinsic hand function that is opposition of the thumb 
and interosseae and lumbricals, restoring sensation on the ulnar border of the hand along with thumb and wrist stabilization. The options available are proximal and distal nerve transfers, proximal or distal tendon or muscle transfers and appropriate arthrodesis. First is the musculocutaneous branch that is a nerve to brachialis which can be used if the biceps is intact. The second is the branches of the radial nerve like the nerve to the supinator which can be used if the biceps is intact or the nerve to the extensa carpi radialis brevis when the other extensors are intact or the nerve to the brachioradialis and also the nerve to the extensa digiti minimi and the extensa carpi ulnaris. When they are transferred to the anterior interosseous nerve, they get back flexion of the fingers. When they are transferred to the pronator teres branch, we get back pronation. When they are transferred to the deep motor branch of the ulnar nerve, reanimation of the interosseous and lumbricals can be achieved. And when there is a loss of extension of the fingers or the wrist, the nerve to the extensor carpi radialis brevis can be used as a recipient or the posterior interosseous nerve itself can be used as a recipient to get back. The complete list of management of brachial plexus injuries is available as videos. Please click to view them and don't forget to subscribe to join us on this journey.